I'm Captain Big Irish. Actually, that's just my codename character in the Global Operations Force. Which, if you get involved with the Kickstarter, you want to check out one of the early updates. We'll tell you about that. It's one of our uh, great uh, things we're going to be doing. It's a club you can join as part of all this. But, in truth, my name is Sean Patrick Fannin, and I am the president of Eagle Beagle Games. I'm also the chief visionary officer. I am also the lead writer and designer for the Freedom Squadron project. Uh, some of you may actually know me from great movies like, well, not really, but from Savage Rifts, Shine Tar, I did a bunch of work for Champions way back when, some Star Wars stuff. Anyway, I've been doing this for a long time, but this is one of the most exciting projects I have ever been involved in. And you're going to find out why. Today, one of the big things we're going to be talking about is the plans and operations rules. This is a set of rules I came up with that is a special innovation that we did specifically for the Freedom Squadron game. However, you're going to find out, as you watch how this plays out, that it could be applied to any kind of game, any Savage Worlds game at all. I mean, if you're doing a fantasy game where your team wants to investigate a murder, you could use these rules. You want to do a Cthulhu-based eldritch horror, you know, investigators looking into the uh, supernatural, this is a perfect game for that. Team of Thieves doing a leverage-style kind of thing, it'll work for that too. This is a set of rules specifically designed to play out all those great montages of crawling through the ductwork or you know, clacking away on the keyboard or making sure you take out that guard real quietly while your friend goes and talks his way past the receptionist. All of those kinds of actions and anything else you can think of plays through nicely in the plans and operations rules and it can be as anything, anything as tight as we're, we're hitting this one building or as widespread as we're spreading across the galaxy and hitting different planets to find out all the things we can about this thing we need to do. Plans and operations, I came up with it not only to do those great Mission Impossible style montages and things, but also so that players would have a reason to use more of their skills more regularly and frequently without necessarily stepping on other people's chance to role play as well. So, for example, uh, one of the guys we have here today that's going to be playing with us is uh, Ed. His character's kind of combat oriented, but we also have David playing his very tech oriented character. In a typical Savage World session, if I give David a huge time to do a bunch of technical stuff, Ed may be sitting there and going, well, I'm waiting for the shooting to start. You know, that's typical standard gameplay. With these rules, you're going to discover that while David's getting a chance to shine the light on his technical abilities, Ed can also describe a cool scene where he's taken out Venom Ninjas to make sure that you know, David's character gets to finish doing the tech stuff. The whole idea is to create an integrated kind of experience in which everyone is having a chance to express all the different things with their characters, but in a way that's collaborative storytelling. That's one of the other things that's going on here, is the collaborative storytelling part. Great uh, quote from Shane Hensley, creator of, of uh, Savage Worlds and president of Pinnacle Entertainment. Uh, he played this session uh, one time, uh, about a year ago, and uh, he said, you got fate all over my Savage Worlds, and it works. So a lot of the narrative kinds of gameplay things you, see, you think of with more, quote, indie-type games and stuff like that, or narrative, player-narrative-driven games, this system is designed to do that. We're proud to be working with Spyglass Games, the creators of the Venom Assault board game upon which Freedom Squadron is based, and I'm working with some amazing people today. Uh, behind the camera is Juliet Meyer. I want to say, hey, Juliet! She's been an amazing part of our team, putting all the media and stuff together. Working with my friend Ray Brules. He's been uh, heading up all our fiction stuff. He's going to be playing Valor today. Uh, Jennifer Scheinfeld is playing a uh, code name. Let me get that from you real quick. She's playing an actual codename character from the original IP, Tundra, so she'll be here today. Ed uh, Doolittle is going to be playing his uh, football-based athlete character, uh, 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 Bullrush. And then David Scheinfeld is playing his tech expert, Gremlin. We also have our friend Chaz, who's going to be watching as we go through. And uh, Chaz Kemp is a pretty well-known artist, by the way. You need to check out his stuff sometime. He's either doing some stuff for you with Beagle. He's going to be kind of watching and kibitzing and asking some questions when we go through the gameplay a little bit later. So, thanks for joining us for this. Sure. So there's a mechanical part to this and a narrative part. Let's start with the gameplay mechanic part first. The plans and operations part of a game session is played out over three rounds, and it utilizes, utilizes a series of cards. So they're going to look a lot like these, and I'll show you these more in detail in a little bit. And there's, there's a deck that you can purchase as part of the uh, Kickstarter, and it comes with the, the Game Master's package. Uh, if you do basically the plans and operations 
uh, stuff, you get the cards with the book. And that's important because the cards are really cool. The cards are laid out on the table, and like uh, as I said, a, a series of three rounds. There's a first round uh, in which there's a set number of cards based more or less on how many players you have and the complexity that the Game Master wants to create. The second round is that number of cards plus one, so slightly more complex, a little bit more things going on. And then the final third round is, again, another that, that previous set plus another one. So say, for example, you start with two cards and become three and then four. So it's played out over three rounds, and there are a series of, of, a series of challenges that the players have to figure out how they're going to overcome. I'll get into the details and the challenges in a bit. As a game master, you're going to be deciding four things. One will be the complexity of the operation or the mission. The complexity determines how many cards the first round starts with, and then how many total cards are going to come out over the course of the gameplay. There's also the difficulty. The difficulty determines how many successes you have to achieve per card in order to complete the total mission successfully. So a relatively easy mission, you may only need one success per card, uh, whereas if it's a more difficult mission, you may need two successes. If it's a really hard mission, you might need three uh, successes per card. And that's on average. So say you only get two successes on one card, well, that means you better pick up an extra success on one of the other challenges later. The third thing that the Game Master has to, see, to decide on is the enemy leadership. The enemy leadership is, under certain circumstances, there's basically cards called Snafu and uh, Disaster, and under those two cards, instead of rolling against a base four, what happens instead, you have to roll against an opposed die roll. And the GM has to decide what that's going to be. Basically, you're up against the enemy leadership. The enemy leadership may be a straight D8, it may be a D10 with a wild die, or it may be as high as a D12 or higher. And the worst part about that is, instead of it just being a base 4, in which case I can't do anything, if you're against me in an opposed role, if I'm the GM, I get to spend my GM Benny's to try to oppose you and make it harder. So, that's the third thing that a Game Master has to cover. Finally, the GM has to decide what the risks are. The risks come into play if any single one of those challenge cards are failed. The team just can't get past that challenge card, or if they fail to achieve the total number of successes they need, something bad has to happen. So the GM has to figure out what the consequences of that are. And there's going to be guidelines for that. Pretty straightforward, easy, just pick up and go guidelines. But then, of course, as a GM, you might want to see that up. So those are the four things that the GM has to decide when putting together a plans and operations session. They're actually pretty easy. You'll find out that it's like, okay, I'm going to run a Freedom Squadron session tonight. I'm going to do a P&O part of the session. Boom, 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 boom. And you're ready to go. You can run that part of the game right off the bat. So, that's that. So you remember when I mentioned that this system is meant to bring out lots of different skills and abilities and to give a lot of spotlight to the broadest concepts of people's characters outside of just their combat ability. Well, to support that, there's four types of challenges that can occur. And again, you'll probably see how this could apply to a fantasy game, science fiction, pulp horror, anything at all. Works really well for a military action game too, which is why we use it here. The four types of challenges are interaction, technical, covert, and tactical. So those words probably mean exactly what you think they mean, but let me get into a little bit more with that. The technical challenges are definitely your tech characters, your, your scientists, your computer whiz, your, your weird science specialists and all those kinds of things, but it's also for your knowledge-based characters. So somebody who's really knowledgeable about law and history, this would be a challenge that they could potentially solve. Investigators of any kind, this can be a great place for them to show off the things that they know and how they are experts at finding clues and stuff like that. It also, and you, if you get into the mystic and psionic elements of the game, so your, your magic and your arcane and occult and psionic base characters, this is a place for them to shine, where they really get to show off their specialties. So technical covers the broadest base of what do you know? What were you trained to do outside of Ura combat? The technical challenges are your place to shine. Covert is, of course, exactly that thing I was talking about before, Parker going through the, uh, the, the, the air ducts in uh, Leverage. The covert character, this is their chance to be sneaky, to use their thieving abilities, to, you know, work their way past things, to bypass the electronic security. So, yeah, the, the hacker tech guy gets to shine here a little bit, too. 
So it's exactly what you think it is. It's the sneak thief covert stuff. Interaction. Here's where our face characters actually get to shine. Here's where buying that charisma, you know, bonus ability really shines. Having a good persuasion skill, having a good streetwise skill, taking that new performance skill that's available in Savage Worlds. All of those are useful. Now I'm going to go ahead and point out all the ones I just note I noted all use the investigation skill as an option to solve the challenge. That's intentional. I love the investigation concept, but not many people have been able to figure out how to make that shine as much as they like. Three of the four challenges in this deck can be solved by having a good investigation skill. So suddenly, I wanted to be a trained investigator means a lot in this process. And then finally, tactical. Why? Because we got to give love to the guys who put all their points in. I shoot things! Really, it's more than that, though. It's oorah! It's climbing, running, jumping, climbing through trees. Thank you very much, Eddie Izzard. It's all of those kinds of things. It's also the pilots and the drivers and the, the boat specialists and all those kinds of things. Guys getting in there and just doing stuff, you know, uh, you know the, the female ninja characters kicking somebody upside the head. Well, that's that challenge. So you can kick people in the head in that challenge type. So those are the four types of challenges. Now, what happens is we will have a challenge card and the team will have to decide who's going to be a lead character. The lead character has to solve the challenge with one of the required skills. Now you'll see on the cards, it actually lists what skills are important, so it's not like you have to guess. The card will tell you, whoever lead character is, they have to use one of those skills to solve the challenge. That's the lead character. Then there's support characters. The general idea is you're going to have, most of the time, at least to start with, more characters than challenges. And that's to encourage the whole team up thing. This system uses the cooperative rules of Savage Worlds. So I mentioned this before. There may be a situation on a technical challenge where David's character, codenamed Gremlin, goes in and is handling a technical challenge. Well, Ed's character, uh, Bullrush, is going to support him on that. Well, okay. David has to choose one of Gremlin's technical skills to solve the challenge as the lead character. Ed's character as a support character, can choose any skill. All he has to do is tell a cool story about how he did it. So he may decide, well, while Gremlin was hunched over the computer keyboard and trying to hack into the system, and that's what we decided the challenge was, a uh, Venom Wasp came up and tried to rip his head off, and, well, I bull rushed him. So I get to use my fighting to do a cooperative role towards David's computer's check. That's how this system works along those lines. Uh, there's also something I wanted to point out. I've got a cheat sheet here, by the way, I don't memorize things well. I'm very tired. Anyway, so the thing is, there's also something that uh, we put into the game. There are special abilities that characters can pick uh, during character creation or during leveling up that allow them to manipulate these cards. So you may get a set of cards you don't like laid out on the table. Wow, we got a bad card there. Remember I mentioned there's a snafu and a disaster type card. Those two cards are awful, especially the disaster card. Oh, it's not good. So it's always good to have that character on hand who's good at manipulating the situation. This is a place where leadership characters shine. There's a, a, a path that players can take when they're building their Savage Worlds characters, buying leadership edges. One of the new leadership edges I added in is called operational, or is, is uh, yeah, called operational planning. And that is an edge that a leadership character can take that allows them to choose an additional card and then replace one of the cards on the board. Ray's character, Valor, has a tactical logistics special ability that allows him to just simply draw or draw and replace uh, a card on the table. So those are really cool things to have and a really interesting option for characters who want to play a leadership or a really cool overall support role that helps the team through these things. So that's that. <laughs>
people were going to try to go through the mechanical puzzle-solving aspect. I did promise you, however, this is a player narrative-driven kind of thing. This is a cooperative narrative kind of thing. Once you decide who's going to solve a technical challenge, then you're going to tell me a story. What is that technical challenge? You know, what are you going to do to solve that technical challenge? What's the story? What's the scene? So each of these challenge cards represents a moment and a grand montage of activity, right? It could be the scene is we start, everybody's around the planning table, right? And looking down at the table or looking up at the Tony Stark, you know, 3D holograms and they're moving them around and kind of looking at stuff. And then suddenly we cut to so-and-so's in the hallway doing a thing. So the point of this is, uh, as each person takes their turn addressing the challenges, and they have support characters who are with them, that group of people then gets to construct a story. Now, if you end up with somebody who's just not feeling comfortable, they just, I just, I don't really, I don't have a good idea here. Well, you know, as a game master, you should definitely feel free to feed into that and be a part of the cooperative storytelling. So one of the players may like. I don't know. Don't you have a contact in Taiwan? Aren't they involved in, like, underground vehicle tech? Because the mission was to figure out why all the cars suddenly turned on their owners. Uh, so I might throw that out there. Suddenly they have an idea, they run with it, and somebody else says, well, you know, I'm going to take my sniper character in support, and I'm going to make sure I'm watching for in Overwatch and taking out Venom Ninjas while my friend goes and talks to their contact. All that can come from the players. And the cool part is, as a GM, you can set the broader concept you have to figure out why all the vehicles in the world have started going crazy and some of them are trying to kill their owners. That's it. You could just throw that out. And then the players go through all these challenges and they can take themselves all over the world and come up with these cool ideas. And then they can tell a story collectively about each of the scenes that they go through. The technical scene, the interaction scene, the tactical scene. Like, all right, you know, uh, you know Valor's going to uh, breach the door and we're all going to go in and we're going to clean this warehouse out. And then we're going to let uh, Gremlin do his technical challenge after we're done, and he's going to go find the computer inside the warehouse. That's the players feeding the story. That's one of the magic parts. That's the part where people, they don't see it until they see it. But once they do, they're like, oh, my God. And the entire game is just comes alive. There's a, uh, there's a great story where I had set up, I don't even know what the mission was anymore. I can't tell you. I can't, all I can tell you is it ended up, with a transport plane on fire, the team's sniper riding the wing. She had strapped herself with harnesses and shooting at mutant bikers who have taken over an airfield in Australia. While the second team, who had gone to Belgium at some point, but they somehow ended up in Australia and they were driving a fuel truck, which they all jumped off of and exploded and took out the mutant bikers. So they all went up in the deserts of Australia which is nowhere I had intended for the story to go, but that's where we ended up, and this, the whole final boss battle was somewhere in the deserts of Australia. That's the kind of stuff that can happen with this system. So that's the magic you just you got to play with, because that's where the players get to feed in and bring all their past histories in and, and run off with the story, but you still there's still tightness, there's still control. It doesn't completely go off the rails. It just feeds creativity into the, the normal gameplay that you're all sharing. So there is a point where this comes to an end, and I mentioned before that one of the things you have to do is determine how many successes you're going to need to acquire. Uh, so say you have a two, three, four game. Two cards, then three, then four. Well, that's nine cards. And if you made it a hard session, that means three successes per card, which means they need 27 tokens. And I say tokens, basically. I use little chips, like little plastic chips, and I just put them on the table representing they acquire the, um, the number of chips, and it kind of tracks how well they're doing. You have to plan for what happens if they don't make it. Now, you know, if you're the kind of GM, and you've established your players, you're the kind of GM, and you say, well, sorry, you're all dead. Eh? I wouldn't do that, but that's that's me. This is Freedom Squadron. But then they all get captured, and now the, 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 the story is about how they're going to have to escape. Or maybe they just end up in a running gun battle, to escape getting captured, or any number of things. So you got to figure out some kind of condition that you're going to deal with if they don't make it. Players being who they are, they'll throw every penny they have and every asset they have, and they'll probably at least get a basic success. And the rules do help you have a, a sense of what the basic mission rewards should be. Then you should also come up with ones that are more specific to the story you're trying to tell. You're trying to tell. Now, the system also encourages you to... Uh, 
well, it encourages the players to strive for extra successes. So there's like a, a success plus five level and a success plus 10 level. And each of those levels provide extra cool things. So for example, uh, the, uh, for success, the rewards are, are bennies, bonus action cards, and bonus adventure cards. Uh, for extra success, basically um, uh, really doing well, you might end up with contacts, special characters that you met along the way as you were playing that become people you can call in later for future plans and operations. Like you may make a technical contact friend. Uh, Ed's character has an interaction friend, an FDA inspector that he rescued the family of, and now he can call him in occasionally to help pave the way through bureaucratic processes. And he calls him in as a support role character for future uh, missions. Focuses. I mentioned focuses. It's a thing that uh, you're going to see in the rules, the core uh, commander manual rules, uh, that allow you to have extra focus. Like, say, you may have the science skill, but you may have the focus in physics. Well, you may earn additional focuses as you're playing the game and say, well, I'm going to take a focus in nuclear physics since we stopped that nuclear bomb from going off, and so on and so forth. You can also earn what are called gear points. This system has a gear point system that allows you to both enhance how much gear you're carrying and enhance the gear you're carrying. So you may earn that as a, a bonus reward. Um, and then usually what happens, now you don't have to do it this way, any number of ways you want to go. My typical session is we do a plans and operations session followed by a boss battle. The boss battle basically is like the extra reward at the end of we found the bad guys, we found out their plans, now we know where they are, we're going to break in and we're going to fight the big boss. And that's Typical session for Freedom Squadron, but mix it up as you will. That's the overview of the system. Now we're going to show you a round of gameplay.